Next piece in line, number 20. That is the crank lever. There are two of these. And this is what it looks like before you get around to bending it. Now, I did some scaling on this because it says right here, scale 2x. I took a caliper and I checked the drawing to see whether or not it was truly to scale or just a representation. Well, it is truly to scale. If that's a fact, then it's 11 sixteenths dimension here, guys, at PM Research, if you're listening. That is incorrect. That should be closer to 1 inch, 160, 170, if everything is to scale. So you might want to take a look at the drawings, or the new drawings, and see if that error remains. I'm going to start this off from 3 16th square stock, and like I did on the other ones, I'm going to leave it extra long, and we'll put a square on this end as well, so I can clamp it this way, of course, and relieve the center out. Then we'll do the taper and finish it up on a rotary table. For the round and the hex. Now on the rotary table, one good way of making sure you don't have an index mark on the outside of your part is to make the inside radius a little bit bigger than the outside. That way you can swing a larger diameter and when you do the profile and pivot around that corner and come back, it cleans up nicely and you have no witness lines on the outside in this area. Okay, let's get over to the vise. Knock the blanks out. The rotary table is directly under the spindle of the machine. I am going to replicate the whole pattern in the fixture plate that I just put in my parts. I will then locate the parts on pins and start the operation from there. The very first operation will be the larger hole, and that is the center. Then I'll have to shift the entire fixture plate or the part to get the other end underneath the center. So I can do the radius on both ends. This is a 50-50. I'm going to make a dog bone out of this piece. And that'll make a whole lot of sense here in a second. Let's do it. With the part securely clamped, I can remove the pins, generate the inside radius on this side, and relieve the entire body out right up to the face of the clamp, leaving a square protrusion on both ends to locate from when I flip the part over.
like I've stated before, the inside radius of this round feature on the end of this little crank is bigger than the radius on the outside. That will give me a cleaner transition of all three surfaces when I flip this part over. Now, for those of you with really good eyes, you may look at this hole and look at the features and say, well, the hole is off-center. It's actually not off-center. It may appear to be, uh, it depends on the difference in the radiuses, of course, the radii. It may appear to be off-center, but it's actually concentric to both surfaces. So if you see something that is just a little questionable, that is what you're looking at. Okay, I'm going to take the part, going to flip it over, going to do the exact same thing to the other side. An intermediate note before I flip this piece over, whenever you have stock like this that's extruded, it's going to have a surface tension to it. Just imagine a bunch of rubber bands running lengthwise along the outer surface of the material. Now when you cut those rubber bands on this side, the rubber bands on this side are going to shrink up because of the tension. And when that happens, you're going to get that. I don't know if you can see that, but that part does bow. See the gap? That is surface stress. In order to avoid this in the future, if you have a production job, you want to take this into consideration. Remove some material on one side, some material on the other side, and it should flex back. But in the meantime, you have this clamping situation. It's like a Morse code, right? I'm sending out for help. Actually, I'm going to squeeze this in device, and I'm going to tap it with a plastic mallet, and I'm going to straighten that out before I clamp it. But just be aware of that. That's what surface stress can do for you. And on a large piece, that is a job killer. All right, let's straighten it out, put it back on the fixture, finish up the other side. Before I go any farther with this part, I want to take a second and go over the thought process of how I'm going to do this and the whys behind it. This is the point of rotation right here, this big pin. So that hole, for all practical purposes, needs to stay round. That being said, I can't broach the square in there and move this part because I will lose the orientation uh, capability that this pin affords me. All right, need to pay attention to that. These outside surfaces, these long, thin outside surfaces need to get a taper cut on them. Being clamped like it's being clamped from one side, this part has to be physically removed from this fixture and flipped over in order to do that. You need these pins for that. During the broaching operation, since it's very thin in this area right here, the pressure will have a tendency to flex this end. I want to be able to put shims under this to support it during the broaching operation. That being said, I can't broach it if I've cut this end off per print because then I won't have a, a lot of room to get under there with the support material in this area right there to keep this from flexing. I'm just thinking as I'm talking here, so bear with me for a second. The orientation of the square going through where this large pin is is at a 45 degree angle well it's a lot easier to control a brooch if it's square moves as opposed to diagonal moves 
So I'll need to index this part at 45 degrees with the brooch face set true to the x-axis. That'll give me a lot more control over the feature right here. And the final step will absolutely be putting the radius on the outside here. This chunk will come off last on this end. Then the entire setup shifts to the right and the nose radius goes on this end. Sure, you could sand it on, but I don't feel like sanding it on. I want to do it on the rotary table. So I'm going to start by putting the angles on the outside edges of both sides first. I will not do any of the radius work on either end. Outside gets it first, and we'll go from there. Ideally, the angle on the outside should run out at the tangent point of the end radius. You can see that's just about where it terminates. That's an ideal cut. Let's flip it over and do the other side. Next operation is to index the part at 45 degrees. Let's put the square drive feature right there. Before I get into the actual broaching of the square feature in the end of this little part, I, wanna, I know I'm going to get questions on this, so I'm going to cover it before I ever get there. First thing I do is I move my machine to the lowest RPM possible. Okay, that's step number one, two, or one of many. Put it in the low range, back gear, back gear, low speed. And the brake on the side, a lot of you guys may not know this if you're new to this trade, but if you take a look at how this is connected, there's a radius on the back here. And that is so when you pull it out, it cams and it locks. So engage the brake, put the brake on, and then while it's under pressure, pull it out. All right, those are the three things that you need to pay attention to. You want to lock the brake. Want to make sure that it's in low RPM, which it's not currently, but it will be, and that it's low range on the side of the machine. Any indexing or any alignment of the brooch, I'm going to do with the nut on top of the machine, and then the only thing you have to deal with is gear lash or any type of movement that may still be present in the drivetrain. Other than that, if you don't have a solid lock or a collar lock on your quill, on your spindle, you're pretty much out of luck. But this is a very low pressure operation. For the broaching operation, I do have shims under the sacrificial material on the end, so this does not flex. And speaking of flex, I can tell you that when you put the angle on the part, down here by this little hole, you can look at the cross section of the material that remains. And that cross section of that material it's considerably less than the surface contact of the cutter here. So you need to be real careful about that or it will grab it and it will pick it up. Don't ask me how I know. I read it in a book somewhere. <laughs> Thank God it was on the second piece off camera because this little ink eye right here just stood straight up. Didn't break off. Another stroke of luck. Anyway, let me indicate the brooch and we'll fast forward through the broaching operation and get back to it. Next operation in line, round off the end. This part can no longer be returned to this fixture. The locating feature is gone. Now, with the same thought in mind, the delicate nature of this end, I am going to step down through that radius 
as I cut it and I will then dial in and finish the blend on the outside. Uh, it's a very deceiving camera angle. There is a break edge on the raw stock on the top, which makes it look like there's a flat, but it's a fairly clean blend right there. I don't want to go any closer because I can put this across the emery and blend anything that needs to be blended. So that's where we're going to end this part for now. The opposite side I will put across the saw, and then we're going to rotate that on a pin and blend that in. Let's take a look at this one on the bench. The square gauge I have is two thousandths of an inch bigger than the squares that I put on the shafts on all the drive components on the machine. So everything on the machine in Imperial is 0.98. This is 0.1. So it's a two thousandths clearance. You can see the break edge on the material right where my left thumbnail is. Makes it look like there's a flat, but it's not. It's a very clean transition. And the trick of making the inner radius bigger than the outer radius is a, is a real good one because it's, if you didn't do that, you, have a, you risk the possibility of having a line this wide around your part. So with the back radius being tighter, it erases it, and you really can't tell the difference. So once the top edge is all deburred, and this is all deburred, I'm going to saw this off and blend that hole in because I just don't trust that cross section right there with an end mill biting all this material off. I think it would lift it. So that'll be next. The 093 pin is down inside the square that I just broached, so there's a couple of thousands worth of slop in here, but I'm going to stay away from the full rotation to get to this end right here. This is the end that was just milled off. I want to put a nose radius on it. You could do it with a pin sander. You could do it however you want to do it. I want to do it this way just for sake of demonstrating what I'm doing. This is a clean end on the fixture. I know what the distance is between here and here, so if I can move the entire fixture accurately, I'll be right back under this pin over here. I plan to do that with a stack of blocks in this gap right here. And then just bump the fixture up against this block once I re-secure it. The part has been returned to the fixture with a general placement of the pin through the square. It's just a couple of thousandths out of rotation, but I'll stay away from a full rotation for the tip. There is a 1 16th dowel pin stuck in. It's about a millimeter and a half diameter dowel pin stuck in there. And that is just to help take some of the vibration out of it. You can do this with a sander. You can do this with a file. You can do this whatever you want, but it's just a personal challenge for me to finish it on the rotary table. Let's do it.
All right, I got to say, it's an awful lot of work for such a small part. Let's take it out, put it on the bench, clean it up a little bit, and take a look. This will ultimately be annealed and bent slightly. Mild offset, not a drastic offset like the drill press was. Just a quick look at it before it gets annealed and bent. Got some of the scuff marks out of it, some of the tool marks out of it. 240 Emery takes care of that pretty good. Clean radius on both sides. Square through the center. Next step is to anneal this thing with a torch and put it in the bending jig and make a little S out of it. Prior to the bending of these uh, cranks, you're going to want to anneal it. So I hung mine from a wire. Hit it with a torch for a couple of minutes. It's very thin, so it's not going to take long. It turned that standard gray color that brass does when it just about turns cherry red. I let it cool down, hit it with some polish. Now we're going to take it over to the bending jig and put an S-bend in it. For anybody that's wondering exactly what kind of bending jig that was, that is just simply a homemade bending jig. It's a piece of aluminum, half inch thick, and cut the size, clean edges, and a bunch of different holes in there for different applications. But these two pins here on the ends are the ones that I use for the bending operation primarily. They are spaced exactly, a couple, not exactly, but a couple thousandths apart from the thickness of the material going in there. And when the arm comes around, it just simply puts pressure on it and bends it to your liking. I have a bunch of these arms laying around. Not laying around, I made them specifically for this jig. And they're blanks like this. So when I get a job that I want to bend, I'll shape the end to suit based on where I want the bend to appear. Sometimes it's a little further away from the pivot pin. Sometimes it's right up against like this one. A handy little jig to have. Real easy to make. 
eighth inch dowel pins, quarter inch pivot pin, that's also a dowel pin, and this is LE phenolic that I have laying around the shop. Once the handles are annealed, finger pressure is all it takes to do this. Nothing, nothing sophisticated, very functional. Next piece in line is the handle that attaches to the crank arm. This is supposed to be brass, but I like the contrast between polished steel and brass. So we're going to make this out of 125 diameter, 1218. First part to do is the small tab that presses into the arm. And then we'll freehand sculpt the contour. Plunging a wide body form tool like this into small diameter material, you risk the material doing the old helicopter move and jumping up and over the tool. So I'm going to sweep this back and forth a little bit to relieve some of the pressure off of this tool. And that also gives me a visual as far as the collar is concerned on the front. I'm sweeping to the right and leaving just a little bit of material behind. And I can go a little bit deeper once I centralize the tool in the feature that I just made. Using a hand ground form tool, I'm going to put the contour feature on the back side of this knob. And if I don't like it, which I don't, I ultimately took the tool out and changed the angle. It'll see me come back in here in a second. And the scale representation shows the angle of the tool has been changed, so the run out goes a little further into the body. This is the first of four of these that I need to do. So I don't have any map of how to coordinate the tools at this time. I like the run out that I just put in with the other form tool. So I'm going to extend the inside body a little bit bigger. Ultimately, I'm going to grab a file and I'm going to take that sharp edge off the inside of this undercut and then blend the whole thing out with Emery. This filing operation is being performed with a small jeweler file that has two safe edges and the four remaining corners of those edges 
are also relieved so I can make contact with the part and not scratch it in any area that I don't intend to file away. Okay, now somebody had left me a comment that said, hey, Joe, that handle looks rough AF. And I think that's, uh, yeah, we're just going to say that means uh, almost fine, but that's not exactly what it means. Now, when you blow something up like this, that's 12 inches across on your monitor, eh, those, those superficial scratches where I'm looking at it right now, it looks like a mirror. But when you blow it up that big, it just doesn't. So you're going to have to forgive me for that. I'm going to put it back in the collet this way. I did leave a little major diameter here and here so I can put it back in a cylindrical, face that off and round this off and polish that as well. And we'll push that on one of those handles that I just made, one of those crank levers that I just made. Call it a day. That is tiny when the fingerprint's almost as big as the part. <laughs> All right. Not a bad job for a Friday afternoon, right? Let's cut that off, clean it up. Once the remnant material has been faced off, I'll take the file and round off the corner, use the emery, and ultimately go to the polish, and hopefully it'll be an undetectable two-step operation. And I'll have the shiniest face of the collet in my entire rack after this. If you look really close, you can see a extremely small gap between the crank handle and the crank lever. That is by design. That is a ten thousandths gap, and that is so that the handle, the steel part, protrudes through the back of this and can be swedged at assembly. Now, the only way to press that flush is with a tube. So during the downtime, during the off time between scenes, I made a brass tube, and with minimal pressure that little gap right at the face of the collet should go away 
there is a stop in this collet so I don't drive the part further in. And there you go. Now when the brass push rod, this guy, comes off of that part, you should see a small protrusion coming out the backside. Which you do. Right there. See the little silver part by my fingernail? Ten thousandths of an inch. That is approximately 0.25 millimeters. So all you guys are going to be splitting hairs. So let's take a look. Boy, I'm happy with that. Let's go to the bench. Here's the final product. Got a couple of index, uh, little witness marks in it from the bending operation from the pins. I do have to make two of these, so I will probably sand them out on the one that's coming up. You can see the 10th protrusion on the back. This entire assembly was intended to be made from brass per the print, but I like the contrast of the steel against the brass, so that's the way I went. Do it however you want. Do it whatever makes you feel good. Just have at it. I do have three more of these knobs to make, three more of these little guys here, because there's a couple more places on this model where they fit. I am getting extremely close to being done. I think I have the tool post and the clapper block and that kind of stuff to do yet. But for the most part, this model is complete. That's an awful lot of work for such a small part that people are just going to look right past when they look at this model. There you go. That was a good shot. I do appreciate you spending your time here with me watching this uh, come to life. I am very excited about seeing this thing done. Thank you very much. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you're well and happy and safe. This is Joe Pye at Advanced Innovations in Austin, Texas on a Friday afternoon. It's time to go home. So that being said, I'm out.